awesome and we're live so welcome to yet another session with the product folks thanks once again for joining us on this beautiful saturday afternoon i think we already have about 65 people joining us live so go to get started uh, for people who are joining us in new just a little bit about on the community to start with uh, then i'll hand it over to akash to walk us through today's um, today's session as well as an intro into our profile uh, our speaker's profile and then over to aniket for a wonderful deck i think we both were discussing this just before the session started you guys are in for a treat feel free to drop any questions in the chat section but um, let's get started um a little bit about the community the product folks is a volunteer driven community of product managers product enthusiasts we've been doing events for the last one and a half years and um, we were primarily offline before the pandemic been hosting a bunch of them online um apart from events we also have a conference coming up next week in the d2c space do check it out we'll add a link to the chat section it's called brandsdecoded.in uh, in case any of you guys are looking for opportunities in the product space do check out our monthly hiring thread it's on twitter and a bunch of other things but i'm not going to delay this session anymore because i'm equally excited to attend it and with that would love to welcome aniket aniket thank you so much for joining us today thanks so us glad to awesome. be here awesome and also introing my uh, co-host today akash who's going to walk us through today's agenda a little bit about the session and a little bit about our speaker so over to you akash yeah absolutely uh, thank you so much swas uh, hi everybody hope you're doing well um, so i'm as excited as you are about the session today but i just want to give you a brief intro into uh, you know uh, aniket's career as such until now and the exciting things that he's done right so aniket's founded uh, multiple companies uh, socratic gozumo raised various rounds of funding as such uh, he was also the director of product management at hotstar and currently he is the ceo coo and uh, co-founder of his latest company which is 100ms which is solving the you know uh, live video challenges as such right uh, so apart from that you know he is also an alum of iit bombay and uh, i did take a look at his deck and i was blown away i'm looking for some really actionable insight insights instead of some generic gyan so yeah anket um, the session is uh, all yours and guys just a heads up the way we are going to structure today's call is anket is going to go ahead with his deck as such if we have some time left we take the q and a uh, as, as well all right thanks akash uh, thanks for joining on a saturday afternoon i hope i uh, i have a tendency to sort of ramble and uh, take this into the evenings if that happens uh, i'm sorry but i i, I hope it it doesn't i'll just give you i think uh, a very quick overview you know you guys can see my screen right yeah yeah cool uh, so today we uh, i'll be talking about sort of very tactical stuff that has helped me develop uh and ship products in various roles uh in big companies and small companies uh as a solo founder as someone who's operating sometimes without a developer sometimes without a designer sometimes who's someone who's trying to break into or sort of understand uh what product management is uh in a lot of these sort of different capacities i've always found shipping products or shipping products uh, under hard constraints as my objective uh and i'll talk about what hard constraints are and this is sort of a summary of all the tactics that i've uh, that i've i've sort of distilled for myself which has helped me develop products fairly uh, fairly good scalable products but fairly quickly um i started off my career as a banker i then decided to do sort of bigger things in life uh, founded an edtech startup called socratic where we were selling software for schools uh, then we uh, then i co-founded gozuma which was india's first peer to peer used car marketplace uh, we scaled this to six cities 300 employees thousands of cars and bikes a, a year uh, we see back we was the fastest growing in our segment we pioneered a bunch of features around the, around sort of used car buying and selling that you still see uh, at this point of time uh, from gozuma i went on and joined hotstar as a director of product management where I was lucky enough to ride the wave of growth from 50 million monthly active users to 200 million monthly active users, uh, and I was sort of part of a very tiny but highly empowered product team, uh, which led most of the functions there as they uh, rode that roller coaster. So I, I, I oversaw a bunch of things, built out the recommendation system, uh, so oversaw growth, built out the data infrastructure. 
but the biggest piece that i handled is still hotstar's crown jewel is uh, which was live sports uh, so everything from ipl streaming to interactive games on top of ipl to premier league to all of those things that was uh, something that i looked at, looked after after my hotstar stint I, I, i sort of experimented with various startup ideas consulted with a few companies uh, and i've now co-founded uh, 100ms which is uh, how can we simplify for developers and builders who are building for the post pandemic world new con- new use cases on top of video so we are building video conferencing sdks right now uh, but uh, how can we sort of simplify the developer experience around this how can we get gold standard quality uh, very very quickly uh, is something that we are trying to build the objective of this talk is again as a quick uh, summarize and we'll go into more details now is tactics that have helped me ship sharp good looking well engineered p0 products under hard constraints the first thing is what are constraints you are typically constrained by two things you are constrained by time let's say i i uh, i am someone who is let's say trying to break into product management or i am a person who wants to start their own business and i am working part time to sort of build a product or form a product thesis or let's say i am in a company early stage startup and i have been asked to build this feature in the next two months the pandemic has hit and i am the community manager at product folks and i am supposed to sort of move very very quickly and make it completely virtual in in let's say a month's time so anything i think time is the first constraint that goes out of the window uh, when you're developing pro, uh, sort of hard constraint products and the second thing which is which isn't talked about enough is is the lack of access to people who typically help you in building product so i think most people here would fall under one category you'd either be pms or designers or developers or general business folks or general curious sort of founder folks or some who are trying to break into product management so let's say if you're trying to build a product on your own or maybe with one of your friends or maybe with someone in your team uh, or if you're in, uh, in an early stage startup which hasn't had sort of uh, the luxury to hire the best developers to hire the best designers then you might not have access to let's say uh, then you would have to sort of don certain uh, Uh, at some point of time become sort of a designer yourself at some point of time become sort of a developer yourself how do you still manage to keep a very high bar of quality uh, is is something that will uh, that we'll touch upon or, or how, how i've done it in the past 10 years uh the people this will help is uh, is a sort of mix but early stage founders they are you are typically constrained by all of these things product owners or pms in early stage startups and honestly in my opinion that i mean if you go beyond let's say the top 10 companies anywhere in any geography or any space if you're not mintra if you're not google if you're not amazon if you're not swiggy uh, then you will typically not have the choice of let's say the best access to designers or all the designers that you would want at all point of time or, or the best de- developers at all points of time so you would want to sort of fill in the gaps yourself in while developing product so i, I think e- not even early stage products pms but slightly bigger ones uh, who are moving fast will, will also work i think i think it will be helpful for them also uh, designers developers or pms who want to cross over so developers who want to become pms or designers who want to become pms i think this will be helpful and aspiring pms uh, you will he- always hear a lot of sort of gyan about hey you should develop product empathy you should be able to understand what developers talk about you should be un- able to understand what good design is then this will give you a sort of a road map of a skin in the game way of actually becoming a designer of actually becoming sort of a developer so that by default gives you more empathy so that develops pm skills for you so hopefully all of you should find uh, some of those things in, in in the talk um before i sort of go further uh well so there's a lot of sort of stuff what this talk will also not be is is hey um you should be sort of focusing on mentoring how do you break into product management by developing let's say these 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 skills broadly or what should be the philosophy of product building all of these things uh will i'll i'll not touch think of let's say you are trying to build a great product and you uh, think of this sort of analogy that you are trying to scale a mountain let's say and uh, everybody tells you hey you have to move sort of towards the top of the mountain uh, which is de- let's say in in terms of becoming a pm you have to develop a cus- customer empathy you have to develop a uh, develop very well designed products you have to de- develop well sc- highly scalable products you should have a sharp product thesis everybody tells you the same things but when you say let's say develop customer empathy what does this mean in actionable terms do i speak to eight people do i constantly speak with people do i speak become a part of my customer service team what does this actually mean and what does this actually mean in real life circumstances where i am right now where i have to ship a product in sort of 3 weeks 
So it will be about when you're trying to scale that mountain, there are several paths that you can choose. There is one path that I have figured out, which I think is sort of the, uh, will solve for a lot of use cases, will still give you a very quick time to ascent and also uh, build something that's that can be scaled further is, is, is that particular path. So these are the three rules that I follow uh, that have helped me build under constraints constantly. A, break rules, but build guardrails. And the third thing, crossover. Break rules, build guardrails, crossover. Let's talk a little bit about breaking rules. So the first thing about breaking rules is you have to know all the rules. And when I say rules, this is rules of traditional product management. And you can pick up any blog, you can pick up any sort of great talk about PMs or building, to, uh, building uh, products. No, you will typically hear these points that they have talked about. There is this PM who's, who, uh, PM talks will always talk about how we spoke obsessively with users. This, I, I, let's, so let's translate this into a rule. Speak with at least 50 users. Write very exhaustive PRDs. Hey, uh, let's say you're doing an e-commerce website. Customers should be able to add to cart, add to wish list, do future shopping lists, uh, be able to see past history, write everything that you can think of. This will, in the future, we'll have a shopping community so that your vision is translated so that all the use cases are thought of. Identify all possible success metrics. And this is this in itself is a sort of chapter in itself. Uh, measure two-week retention, measure Daubamau, measure just uh, percentage of people converting, measure everything, and then figure out what's working, what's not working. These are sort of the unsaid rules. Uh, if you And if you're just looking at blog posts of successful products, because all of these people would have done one of these things well, either written exhaustive PRDs or spoken with too many users or spoken or attract very sort of granular metrics, the rules that you sort of club together in your mind would be, hey, all PM should be speaking with these many users, writing PRDs, and identifying all metrics. And it's the same follows for designers. Designers are constantly being told to sort of, A, first you have to do user research, then you do wireframes, then you do grayscale prototypes, then you do sort of interactive tests on grayscale prototypes, then you do multiple approaches, and then you finally do a, a full mockup. And treat every single component, every micro interaction, hey, this menu opens, is this the right way for the menu to open? Is there, can there be better physics around it? Can I, can I rethink the menu in some other way? Treat every component as Mona Lisa, right? This is typically what you're taught in design schools. When you hear some designer talking about their success of or some design component, they would tell you how they treated it as Mona Lisa. Um, for developers, and uh, these are the, I mean, uh, these are, you guys are, or, so sort of, I'm, a, I'm also a part developer. Uh, the most opinionated, op opinionated of, I think, the three bunch, uh, three groups of people. But it's sort of drilled into most good developers. Never use generated code from, let's say, themes. Don't pick a theme from theme for a Shopify theme, Wix. They will never scale. Write the code yourself. Don't use hacky stuff for internal tools. Don't write your, I mean, maintain your initial CRM on Airtable or Google Sheets. That, that will never scale. Just, it's all, it's just a tiny Python Django template or something like that. Why don't you code it in the next one week? So these are sort of common rules that you constantly hear. Uh, developers will constantly talk about, hey, writing things that scale. PMs will talk about always speaking with as many users, identifying all possible metrics. Designers will always talk about, hey, talk to, do, research, try multiple approaches, and go into the whys and uh, interactions of every single thing. These are all the rules that you would typically gather from sort of gyan around the internet. But once you know the rules is where you can start breaking them. And this is what will help you uh, develop products fast. And this is the crux of the entire talk. So I'll just uh, you know go through this slowly. Don't speak with 50 users. And I have a very prescriptive number. Speak with eight users. This is this is deliberately a little sort of uh, attention grabbing. Eight, uh, but I'll explain what this eight users means uh, as I go later. Don't write exhaustive PRDs. Speak with completer PMs and write only P0 and P1 user stories. That is the things that you're going to launch now and the things that you're going to launch potentially in the next two weeks if no bugs come up. That's it. This is the most important one. Don't identify all, identify all success metrics, but track and obsessively track just one single metric. Don't look at anything else. Designers invest time not uh, sorry invest time in identifying your Mona Lisas. 
as opposed to sort of creating everything as your Mona Lisa's. Developers never say no to sort of bot themes for code bases. Identify themes or that generate high quality code that will always scale. Never say no to internal tools like Airtable, Google Sheets, or Notion. Identify meta internal tools that do scale. So let's say Sheets, Retool, Redash, and we'll talk about these things. So PMs don't speak to 50 users, eight users under certain constraints. Don't write exhaustive PRDs, speak with your competitors, PMs, and use their insights to write just P0, P1 user stories. Measure a single metric, never measure se several metrics. Designers, spend time in figuring out what is important as opposed to treating everything as important. Developers, uh, just with an open mind, start looking at themes that generate high quality code, start looking at tools that generate high quality code. All right. So the, the, uh, the broken rules are in, in certain ways for what I call guardrails or my guardrails for developing fast products, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll just reiterate very quickly. So PM process, eight users, single metric, speak with computer PMs. Design process, designers, just pick your Mona Lisa's. Development process, just use templates at scale, use tools at scale. And in what I'm also effectively saying is if you do this within constraints you'll always be able to build sharp products which is the responsibility of the pm good looking products which is the designer's responsibility and scalable products which is the developer's responsibility now i've always been talking about in terms of our first um, in first person responsibilities if you're a designer then you pick your mona lisa but every time i say that always think that if hey if I'm doubling up as a designer, I'm a developer, or I'm a PM who's doing my own design because I don't have access to a designer. Or maybe I have a designer friend who I'm calling up, but uh, that designer is only there for 20% of the time. The 80% of design I'm doing myself. So in, in, these, in those cases, think of that pick your Mona Lisa's uh, instruction as a tactic uh, to sort of uh, quicken your pace. So the same advice translates to both designers themselves or people who are doubling up as designers. Similarly, developers who are doubling up as PMs, right? Effectively, what this does is if you're a developer who's doubling up as a PM, there's a lot of things that you have to sort of develop over time. Let's say product sense, execution sense. Uh, Shreyas does a fantastic talk of figuring out, uh, telling uh, uh, what these sort of qualities are. Uh, but if you follow these guardrails, you'll get to 70, 80% of this just because of sort of you're following very sort of tight guardrails and you can't go wrong. Uh, and that will help you get to a 70, 80% without experience very, very quickly. Let's touch upon all of the three points that I talked about uh, that will help PMs ship faster. PM's primary job in this case in shipping P0 products, or P0 as in when you're launching products is, is usually hey, figuring out what is the right problem to solve and just and for ensuring what that focus for the team should be. Uh, so let's say if, if you're... Uh, building a wealth management product. Uh, do I focus on uh, yuppies who are saving or do I uh, uh, focus on Gen Y people who are trying to invest or do I try to just do a mutual fund direct platform? Do I do insurance? A bunch of things, right? I broadly want to, let's say, solve the wealth management problem. What is the one tiny thing which is a big problem for a one tiny set of audience which can then potentially become a big business or big product in itself. So that's usually the PM's first job. And all of the three tactics that I've, I'll talk about will help you get to those things very, very quickly or under constraints, right? The first thing that I talked about is the most controversial one is just to speak to eight users. Now, this doesn't mean you actually speak to just eight, eight users. What it means is you pick eight users of a similar demographic or a similar need base, and then you go very, very deep with them. So for example, uh, in, in GoZoomo, which, uh, which I talked about, which was a peer-to-peer -peer use car start startup that we started, uh, we went from ideation to landing page, I think, in two weeks. Uh, it took us, uh, I think, the first three days to speak to about 10, 15 sellers. And then I've, uh, so what, what was sort of fairly evident at that point of time was it's a pain to buy secondhand cars. It's a, it's a, it's a muddled market. You don't know what the right car is. You don't know what the right price is. What model should I be buying? Who is the seller? Is he a thief? Is he a genuine, legit person? What is the quality of the car? Has this, I mean, is the service history fine? Uh, who will verify this for me? Then the transfer of the paperwork process is just massively complicated. You usually don't get loans for used cars. So when, when you're sort of doing these general conversations with people, uh, you typically get a sort of complicated list or laundry list of problems and we got all of these laundry list of problems and then the next step is for you to be able to figure out 
uh, hey, what is important, what's not important. Now, there are two ways of doing this. You constantly keep on doing this, you do this with 50 people, 100 people, and you'll eventually be able to get to, let's say, a laundry list of one problem. What the shortcut that I use is just pick eight users who are all similar. So in this case, we picked up sort of similar income range, similar uh, sort of social backgrounds, uh, sellers. And then we told them, hey, why don't we sell your cars for you? And we actually sold eight cars in about three days. And selling those cars, skin in the game, very quickly told us, because when you're actually selling it, you're focused on actually selling it, you're going through the bias problems very, very sort of intimately. It's not a, it's not a Google form that you're uh, uh, analyzing. It's not a, uh, uh, let's say, 30 minute call that you're asking theoretical questions on. It's actually selling those things. So if you pick eight users who you go very, very deep with your problem, that helped us get to just one single problem. In this case, it was just the car quality. Everything else we realized people can manage themselves or is a secondary thing. But this is where they stumble. Uh, is the car... Is, 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 is this going to have scratches or dents? Is it going to fall apart in the next three months or not? Can someone trustworthy tell me? So we just... Uh, after just, just selling these eight cars, we... we we said, let's focus on just this one thesis. Everything else I think is secondary or maybe can come in later. And then we literally, I think, I think just built up static website with just pretty photos. We went around uh, taking pretty photos, got a mechanic, got an inspection report done. Uh, this was a time when all of this wasn't being done in India at that point of time. And then we just put it up on common uh, sort of selling portals. And then this caught up like wildfire. And that sort of single germ of an idea of, of car quality then sort of grew into uh, we are doing million dollar gmv eventually uh, we were selling thousands and thousands of cars a year we went uh, expanded to bikes uh, fairly high nps we ended up building all the features that you see here so we ended up building some stuff around car pricing seller identity simplifying transfer process loan but what that eight people conversation enabled us is to stop having conversations and ship something quickly and then use that as a base to then iterate and figure out, okay, what is the next thing that needs to be built? Or if this is wrong, then what needs to be built? So stop. So if you're building under constraints, reduce those conversations and start making fake, not fake or realistic sort of products using some thesis. It might be the wrong thesis. It's okay to have the wrong thesis. But uh, be very, very sort of uh, uh, rigid about putting a stop very quickly and then launching something. To put this sort of uh, sort of hardwire this in my mind, I've just said after eight. So even with my current company, uh, this moment we sort of spoke with, we spoke with about I mean, 10, 15 companies, but with eight companies who are similar, mid market, ed tech, similar kinds of problems. We spoke with them. Uh, with two or three of them, we sort of did very dirty POCs end to end, and then we realized, okay, this is the problem. This needs to be done. We put up our landing page. We got more customers, and then now we are building our V1s and V2s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, so the first thing is just don't speak constantly speak with users. If you're under constraints, speak with eight users, but deeply use it to build a thesis to start the next conversations. The next thing that I'll talk about is using a single metric. So this is something that I personally uh, didn't understand or didn't appreciate enough. So in my earlier company, Gozumo, uh, I used to obsessively uh, measure probably the most advanced uh, technical data analytic data company, which was trying to sell secondhand cars, a very mundane job. Uh, but I, I, we would have trackings for people like people who chatted after two weeks, how many of them ended up buying? Or what is the third week retention of people who came from this particular user channel? And you used to measure everything and then assign people to sort of optimize these tiny, tiny things. And this clouded over the fact that eventually the problem, the broad problem was uh, in, in India, people sort of the behavior change of people buying cars online was, I mean, a few years away. You want to touch it and feel it. You're not trying going to buy it online. Uh, when I joined Hotstar, I was, uh, I was like a kid uh, in a candy shop. There's, there's going to be so much data. It's it's just uh, this fantastic company with, uh, uh, with so many millions and millions of users. I should be able to figure out how to optimize with tiny, tiny things, everything. I just spent, I think, a couple of weeks just going through the data and creating dashboards, et cetera, et cetera. And then I went to the CEOs and CPTOs and then presented all of these things. Hey, look, uh, this tiny retention thing, this, uh, this particular entertainment cohort, uh, we should be trying to do this, etc. They looked at everything uh, and they 
and they effectively came back to me and told me, look, we are going to give, going to give you one single metric, and this single metric is across the floor, and that single metric was watch time. If you if you do anything. I don't care if you're increasing retention by X bits. I don't care if you improve onboard percentage by X much X bits. You have to increase watch time. That's what you're going to be measured against. That's what the entire company is going to be measured against. And these are sort of fantastic people who are setting these constraints. Uh, Ajit Mohan, who was the CEO of Hotstar then, is now the CEO of Facebook. Uh, Varun Narang, who's still the CPO of uh, Facebook, was an early employee at Hotstar. So for a company that was so knees deep in data, it was refreshing to see how uh almost cavalier they were with in terms of not obsessing about the minor details of data and this does wonders in terms of giving the organization clarity and giving you as a pm uh, a lot of clarity and we were also operating you know the hotstar was a big company we had it's a very small team that was working at that time which meant we were forcibly forced to always pick features that would you know move the needle for the biggest thing which was watch time at that point of time and uh, and that's how sort of the company grew from obsessing. I mean, you can see all the other OTT platforms that have come up or have, have tried to work. But this obsession with watch time for a long time ensured that Hotstar's tech product platform and in general sort of the growth stayed way above uh, anybody else. Uh, when the right time ca came, you will always be able to switch this single metric. So Hotstar has now switched to revenue. Uh, but for us, for at any point of time, you always obsess with a single metric. This, if you're an early stage founder or early PM, will de deliberately force you to write P PRDs or write products which will always focus on one tiny feature or one small feature or one core thesis. So this is the second thing, uh, single metric. Now, third thing is talking to competitor PMs. And I think this isn't talked about enough. It, it's talked about as a general principle, but isn't enforced as a practice enough. So this was my task when I was at Hotstar. Uh, we had sort of fixed a lot of our video streaming problems and now we're th uh, thinking of actually pushing the boundaries of what a live sports product should look like. Live sports obviously evokes a tons of emotions within you, right? You're supporting for your team, you're uh, uh, discussing along with your friends, you're playing fantasy games. Uh, how do we elevate Hotstar from just this tiny black rectangle, which is uh, just receiving the video and you can play and pause? How can we sort of make it more uh, emotionally closer to what you feel during the match. And we had tons of discussions around this and we sort of broadly came down to let's do a mix of a tiny fantasy game within the, uh, within the, uh, <coughs> sorry, within the uh, match. So while the live match is playing, let's get people to uh, try and sort of play something or play something for some kinds of rewards so that their time spent increases, so that watch time increases. Again, the overall metric is still watch time. So everything that I do is still for watch time. Now, this was a very tough problem for me. I, I, I didn't have any background in fantasy. I didn't have a, any background in uh, gaming. And I had to launch this in three months. And I, IPL is a, uh, is, is a tricky beast in the sense that you that tournament comes actually in April, April and you can't really do a 1% launch or a tiny alpha launch before that because there is no cricket tournament before that. So you have to launch to 100%, which means your P0 has to be perfect. So you're under immense pressure. I'm, I've never done gaming before and I started reading about gaming. And game has, gaming has these complex uh, paradigms, in-game currency, reward ladders, P2P, gacha boxes. Fantasy in itself is a big complex thing in itself. What are the different fantasy models? Do you do daily? Do you do uh, uh, series-wise? Do you do P2P? Do you do public? Do you do 5 wars? Do you do single match? And I was just overwhelmed with everything. How do I sort of distill all of this information into a single sort of game that is launchable in the next three months? And I didn't have more than two weeks to edit and fix this thing. So instead of spending four hours, five hours, just daily speaking to some experts or uh, speaking to or reading up on what different mechanisms should be. I just tried finding PMs, actual PMs who've shipped to the exact same, pro who've gone through the same uh, product thesis and shipped it somewhere else. And I, and we eventually managed to find someone who had not only done fantasy and who'd actually built gaming companies. He listened to us for 30 minutes and he distilled all of this into a very simple paradigm. He told us, look, you're, you are clearly going after scale. You're not looking after at revenue at this point of time. You want watch time to increase, which means your game should be simple, which means your game should be as simple as possible. How simple? Single tap, you win something. That's it. This automatically throws out 90% throws out of game design principles that I need, which is great. Then he told me, okay, uh, fantasy, similar principles. There can be complex fantasies. Pick your team, 11 people, three people, but 
everything is complex your fantasy needs to be as simple as uh, as simple as possible uh, can we do let's say uh, then we start brainstorming uh, uh, five over fantasies what will happen how many r- runs will be scored in the next five overs no that's too complex one over fantasies who's going to get out in the next one or too complex what's going to happen this ball uh, in this ball and this then what became sort of this genesis of an idea oh this is obviously this is now not even fantasy this is something that you're constantly thinking of in your natural flow of, of the game you think of hey what's going to happen in the next ball this doubles up this is sort of a minor reduced version of fantasy tap on it and you win that's it so i i didn't have i could have got the, uh, the plethora of decisions that were facing me when i was on this cliff of jumping down and saying okay we want to build a game i could have gone down several routes i could have built a dream like clone i could have built a let's say zomato style hey what who's going to win in this match i could have built tons of things but what for us would have worked best within the cons- i didn't have the time to figure that out i didn't have the time to test it out this sort of one person and a couple of other people who are experts speaking with them just gave me clarity of how to ignore everything else build this tiny game this game ended up being played by 20 million odd people we are the most played game by default by that in that month uh it increased watch time significantly for every single person who played ended up doing a decent chunk for the bottom line it ended up decently increasing our uh, watch party and it this wouldn't uh, sorry watch time and this wouldn't have happened had i not sort of actually gone out and sought that person who would have given me that clarity had i sort of continued to write everything that i could have thought of and try and sort of pick something off of that uh, after testing i didn't just have the time to do it so this is very i think uh, under appreciated speak to someone who's just done it they will always be able to tell you hey do people don't care about this people don't care about this just build this so pms these three things uh eight users single metric speak to computer pms trust me 70 80% of the times you'll always end up with a very sharp well defined thesis which won't be wrong now how can designers move quickly so i'll pick the same example and i was working with a fantastic designer called anant pai uh, at that point of time uh so this is this is a game screen and we are designing the same same game uh this has about 11 or 12 screens you have uh, your list of friends you have your reward list you have uh, Uh, your scores your put few past questions future questions and a bunch of these screens about 12 13 odd screens and then there's the core game screen which is hey what's going to happen on the next ball uh, which is this this tiny portion and if you tap on something you win something now we could have sort of made this into a creative process in itself and like most games do and try and design all of these screens you know uh, in a fun meaningful way where all interactions are great we didn't have the time to do it unfortunately so my designer uh, he smart he understands this he, he said look of i'll just spend one to one and a half weeks on a single screen all the other screens i'm going to pick up hotshot's current design guidelines and i'm just going to sort of give it a tiny coat of paint and just put it there we are not going to overthink about uh, the friend screens or the list of reward screens we are not going to uh, do any new interactions there no experimentation as it completely fine he said uh, then i pushed him why do you even need to sort of read design the core screen this is a stupid question but i deliberately asked this and then he said because this is a problem that we are probably the ones who are going to solve it for the first time the user design problem was if you are watching the match in portrait mode you are looking up on the screen towards the match uh, while the ball is being bowled when the ball ball has been bowled and what's usually called the dead ball period then your eyes can wander your attention can wander which is when we should be attracting attention to the uh, lower port- portion of the game of the screen mm-hmm. and then after the game has taken your attention then you have to move your attention back up so you constantly have to do this up down up down motion with your eyes this is not a ux problem that anyone else in the world has solved so let's spend time on this and then he did several iterations on this the first iteration that we had was exactly copied from let's say quiz up or kbc or one of those things so four options and then a tiny circular timer and then i realized okay all of these would have certain issues either they are always screaming for attention and distracting from the main event which is the video or they are too subtle and then you are not distracted or and uh, they don't attract attention at all then he came up with these sort of really cool design where there is a tiny bar that's sort of gently throbbing while the ball is being bowled and when the uh, ball has been bowled then it sort of starts becoming a, a little bolder and starts throbbing in a sort of nice uh, graduated fashion so your eyes automatically wandered on and then 
as soon as you sort of choose an option, it completely goes dead and gray, and then you automatically move your eyes up. And uh, this, he actually made this design after development had been picked. But because the design actually made that much of a difference, we actually tested it internally with 20 people. Every single person immediately said, oh, this is this is significantly better. We actually went out, went back and uh, re restarted development on the entire thing. So Anant, by choosing not to sort of go after a lot of the other screens and just focusing on this, ensured that this feature became a success. And uh, uh, I mean, he, he's written, gone on to write blog posts on detailing how he uh, went through the entire design process. Uh, but this also ensured that he actually built something really, really good that he can always call his own uh, and innovated where it really, really mattered. So for designers, if you're sort of constrained for time, there'll always be several things that you'll look out, uh, look out for. And if it's something that's been done by 80% of companies in, so in a standard way, and it's not going to move your business core thesis much, don't try and redesign it. Try and sort of copy it, try and sort of keep it fairly standard and just innovate where it's genuinely necessary to innovate. And uh, the third component, developers. So there are two kinds of developers, front-end developers, back-end developers. I hate the distinction, but let's just go with it for now. If you're a back-end developer who's trying to double up as a front-end developer, or if you're a front-end developer who's going to develop under constraints, use templates that scale. Right? It's commonly said that never buy a theme for a template. It's shit code. You'll have to throw it out after a few, uh, don't use an admin bootstrap template. All of that is right. In general, templates or HTML, CSS templates that you see to pick up or, or build websites very, very quickly uh, will have crappy code. But there is an exception, and that exception I'll keep harping on several times. It's a very specific exception. is utility first CSS. And this, this is a very web-specific talk, so this, uh, this is just for web. Uh, utility first design framework called Tailwind. Just pick any Tailwind CSS template. So for example, so just pick the official Tailwind UI templates. And as long as you're using that for that 80% of the design work that we just talked about right now. So if you're, let's say, doing traditional home pages, traditional dashboards, traditional menu bars, nav bars, don't innovate there. If you use Tailwind UI, uh, you should be able to build fairly professional looking websites. So for example, our current homepage, I didn't have an access to a designer when we initially launched it. I just knew that I had to focus on the video part of it. So these assets, uh, these are actual live videos on the website, and I needed them to drive home the point of what we are trying to do. But everything else, this navbar, this sort of homepage video, doing the typography for this, doing the sort of, uh, sorry, color scheming for this, all of this is not my strength. I am not as good a designer. I has, have as sharp a design sense as, let's say, any other designer, which means I just stuck to Tailwind UI, did some tiny customizations to make it feel like mine, but I never moved away from their guardrails. Uh, so I didn't try and be adventurous. So it will always end up looking good. And for this, I genuinely engaged a designer who's really good. And then he built the videos that drive home the point. So do similar things. I mean, if you're a front-end developer, don't try and write the code entirely yourself. Uh, but also don't use crappy templates. Use just Tailwind UI. There are other tools that I really, really recommend very highly. Use Next.js. Um, it's, a, it's a single app server-side rendered framework, which all the goodies that you would want. Uh, use Material UI inputs. Use Formic for forms. Forms. So Tailwind UI, Material UI, Formic, Next.js. This is my bootstrap sort of uh, boilerplate for for choice. If you use this for website, this should be good enough to scale. For if you start off and you become Flipkart, you can still stick with this uh, these four tools, and your uh, web I mean your website will scale perfectly well. And backend developers, similar similar sort of prescription. Use tools that scale. So typical backend dev does all of these uh, thing, things. You typically develop your, set up your DBs, build out data structures, write ORMs. Uh, you'll write some backend APIs or some middleware. Uh, you'll write some DevOps to handle uh, where, where all the servers are, how should they scale, uh, what are the sort of access controls, etc. You'll build some kind of auth system. How will the user log in? How are they stored? You'll build some internal tools or CRMs. Uh, uploading, let's say, inspection reports in our goes in Gozumo's case or CRMs. Hey, how do you track all the salespeople's dashboards? And then you will build some data infrastructure analytics. Uh, I mean, uh, all developers or good backend developers' first tendency is just to build all of this themselves because they. I mean, it's 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 interest, interesting problems and you can build all of this yourself. This is my answer to resist the temptation. Choose Hasura, and this is again a very prescriptive answer. 
choose Hasura as your DB. It's a wrapper on GraphQL, wonderful company right here in Bangalore, does great work. Hasura will give you, uh, uh, if, you if you need the flexibility to still be on Postgre, because you don't want GraphQL because that doesn't scale, you'll still be on Postgre. But if you still want the flexibility of being able to access APIs, CRUD APIs automatically, uh, you won't have to write anything. Uh, Hasura does that. Instead of DevOps, just use Vercel. You'll fall in love with it. Uh, you just do your constant, usual GitHub style, hey, I want to commit to uh, this branch. It will automatically do all the good things that's needed. SSL, SSL certificates, HTTP, HTTPS, re redirection, image compression, uh, different staging, production branches, everything is abstracted out. Uh, you don't, you, if you are a front-end developer, you don't have to really then go into uh, like Amazon, uh, Route 53 optimizations, all of this. Just just use Vercel, you'll be good. Auth systems, don't build your own, use Auth0. Internal tools or CRMs, trust Retool and AppSmith. They are wonderful tools. So I've been using, uh, so AppSmith, again, fantastic company right here in Bangalore. Either of these things will be good enough to take you to seven or eight salespeople for CRMs. Uh, if you're lower than that, anything else, so uploading inspection reports, images, anything like that, all of these can be do, done in a couple of hours using these tools. Data infrastructure, just pipe everything to segment and send everything to amplitude and forget about everything else for the next few weeks. I'll tell you the extreme example, and this is not an example from my, uh, uh, sort of, my history, but there's there's this uh, B two B company that I know, uh, which does uh, double digit million dollar ARR sales to fairly sophisticated tech clients. Uh, they have four hundred five hundred odd employees, um, and they have massive data operations, sales operations. Uh, all of this has completely been built on Google Sheets, and I think Google Sheets is still the OG of all these internal tool uh, internal tools. Most backend developers or good architects would frown on Google Sheets has so many constraints. Google Sheets is not supposed to be a DB. It's not supposed to be your backend. It's not supposed to be your admin and template. But if you get the same kind of sort of rigor that you put into designing your Python backends into Google Sheets, it's wonderful how well they can scale. So this company found that sort of one champion. And this person has been able to sort of scale Google Sheets where all these 500 people use it extensively for everything. Uh, and it runs fantastically smoothly and they've been able to sort of leverage this at uh, advantage because now for Google Sheets development, you just need very basic JavaScript knowledge and JavaScript development. So they've been able to hire freshers, they've been able to hire uh, very young people out of Infosys and a small team, which is able to run this also very, very efficiently. So it becomes an org advantage in itself. If you are always designing complex Python systems, then you'll have to find those complex Python people. If you're developing your DevOps on AWS and scaling using managed services, then you'll have to find people who will always be able to do that. If you try and sort of repurpose certain tools which abstract out a lot of all of this, then you'll start, though, won't need all, all of these people's. Very specific, specific Hasura, Vercel, Auth0, Retool, AppSmith, Segment. Use these things, your lives will be much, much faster. Uh, we've talked about breaking rules and sort of developing guardrails to break those rules to move faster. The last piece, and this sort of general horizontal advice, this doesn't apply to everybody, but anybody who's curious and who's the target audience for this talk, cross over. PMs, learn to code. Go through Fleet Code, code Camp 101. Uh, do repel, replicate, uh, repel.js, uh, xis, build an app on Next.js, build a sam tailwind sample app, use Hasura, learn to design. There's this fantastic uh, uh, book called Design for Developers ebook, uh, which is done by, built by the founders of Tailwind. Uh, they explain design from a developer's perspective. So I think that will be wonderful to see it. Designers learn to code. Uh, you can start off with Webflow if you want to, but try and see if you can actually pick up what Tailwind does and try and do the basic HTML CSS of tail, uh, uh, what uh, basic HTML CSS from Tailwind. It'll be wonderful. It'll take some sort of powering through, but if you are able to do it, uh, you'll sort of unlock another level in your career. Developers, A, learn to design. Just do the same, uh, go through the same book, Design for Developers, and rotate. Just don't be a backend developer. Become the front-end developer, even if you have a distaste for it. Become a front-end developer and try and find joy in it. Uh, try and find sort of systems where you can apply the, uh, uh, whatever your sort of backend thinking is. Build pages using Tailwind UI yourself. Front-end developers, go onto the backend side, try and sort of manage AWS, try and manage, uh, write data structures, design DBs. All of this is to say, as, as long as sort of PMs are able to cross over, designers are able to cross over, developers are able to cross over, you will in general become a much better sort of individual contributor and 
a much better path to sort of growing into more responsible roles through your career summary is break rules build guardrails and crossover so pms speak with eight users single metric competitor pms designers pick your mona lisas developers use templates at their scale use tools at scale all right yeah that's it i think i managed to do it fairly quickly i'm fairly i'm proud of myself so as uh, what's next no absolutely absolutely i think this was like a master class like a concise master class because often like um, like you you mentioned right those prescriptive but that's often the question most talks people tend not to be prescriptive for for the very fact yeah they tend not to be prescriptive but then becomes hard for a lot of people to take away something from this so i think lots of interesting things for people to at least get started then definitely they can explore and you know there will always be alternatives but i think this was great thanks for putting you know it in such a concise manner and in half the time so definitely we can stick around for some question answers if that works for you i think 15 minutes left we can take some questions from the chat section as well as some that we have in place sure. yeah awesome Awesome. Akash, do you want to start? I think we have a couple of questions. We can start there, and then I will also have a look at the questions tab here. Let's try taking some from here. What do you think? Awesome. Akash, I think you're on mute. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm so sorry for that. I think the most commonly used sentence. Uh, okay, great. So, so uh, Ankit, the questions have has been in my mind ever since you started the deck. So we spoke about shipping products really fast. but i was uh, hoping to understand after 2018 you know there was a break for about 2 years before you started 100 ms so was the was it the brainstorming that was going on for 2 years or just wanted to understand what was the sabbatical all about oh that's a deep cut <laughs> uh, uh, no so uh, so uh, so after i sort of i was at my happiest at hotstar i delivered this fantastic product scaled really well uh, built out enough charters built a fantastic team but i realized that i always wanted to start up it's always been in my mind so at the end of 2018 i realized this is the right time to again start up i've sort of plateaued uh, at off with my learnings at hotstar and i then for me it's, it was always a question of what i'll pick not if or when so i'd sort of given me an infinite time stretch to now pick an idea that will that i'll stick with for the next 10 years of my life as, as you can see i i've sort of wandered around a fair bit in my life i have done at tech startups i've done uh, i mean uh, uh, i've sold cars uh, this time i was fairly sure that if i'm trying to and there was after having done this for several uh, several times uh, i had sort of a, a sort of tiny set of frameworks where i was sure that this is the kind of company that i want to build and this is the space that i want to build i should have a massive unfair right to win it should be something that if i'm being punched every day in my nose i should still and i'm not getting paid i should still wake up in the morning trying to solve that problem and i just said i'll give myself enough time to find that problem so i initially started off with one idea i started off with another idea i started off with another idea. i think i tested three or four ideas during this time i uh, because i didn't want my mind to sort of uh, get uh, rusted in that period i also consulted several startups at that point of time but a lot of these some of these were in the public eye some experiments so i did photon academy which was a lambda school clone uh, there was a wealth management startup which had sort of private alphas uh, but i kept on doing this until i sort of came on to 100 ms where it was just an amazing amazing fit uh, and when i found it i found it got that's awesome Awesome, awesome. So another one on that line. I think you spoke about shipping, right? And a lot of things on what you can do from zero to one. So first you startups, then move to hotstar. What are some learnings that you had over all these three things that you are trying to apply to hundred MS? Not only on shipping, but in general around product management or around hiring. What are some things that you are definitely trying to consciously apply in this latest stint? Sure, I think a lot of those. learnings have already been distilled onto this uh, deck i think the first thing that i realized that we did very very well in gozumo was just very a great first principles thinking and that's th- thanks to uh, arnav who was my uh, co-founder so having an outsider's perspective into an industry that you're getting into and we are all all of these were sort of bunch of young folks who had come together core team super sharp first principles thinkers and we built a lot of great things uh so all of those features all of the sort of strategic decisions that we took then uh are sort of you can you'll find it in most companies around at uh, even right now 
uh, a lot of those people have gone on to become founders. So Jani is now CEO of Local, Gaurav is now CEO of HeloFi. Uh, several people have now heads of design, heads of product, heads of ops. Uh, so that first principles thinking, uh, we still stick to having that outsider's perspective, we still think uh, stick to. What I didn't realize was this first principles thinking also meant that we are breaking a lot of rules in terms of product management and design and development. This is now how I distill it into a sort of talk or, 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 or my prescription is we are breaking rules. So we're constantly breaking rules even right now. The thing that I learned most from Hotstar is, um, is two things. I think there is a, a refreshing um lack of obsession with data and the faith that they took in big bets it's insane how much uh so they would ransom the entire company they would bid two billion dollars to take for ipl plus ipl rights there's no way you can measure how how well or how how bad that's going to do but they'll be sort of because you're a media company you're used to consistently take these big bets without data and then because you are you have faith in it the entire idea that kabaddi should be the second most and it still is the second most popular sports in india came because uday shankar who was the asia pacific chairman of uh, uh, disney uh, asia so 21st century for star at that point of time did this research around what sports should be the one that should be promoted after cricket after ipl success and all of this data they i mean they spent a uh, several million uh, uh, a lot of money on user research and came out with soccer came out with uh, a couple of other games kabaddi was nowhere uday shankar said start kabaddi because i have faith in kabaddi because of certain intuition that i have built that is now india's most second most popular sport and the amount of sort of uh, a the audacity of those bets and the commitment to those bets after they've pumped in those two billion dollars after they've then they will leave no stone unturned so if i have to put in uh, ipl digital rights and i'm going to hire the hulu product head to hire uh, india uh, to get to india i will actually pay top dollar to get facebook's li facebook live videos inventor to india i will then spend tons of money in marketing to get get to that so ha so this is something that's typically missing in tech first startups or in in the typical silicon valley gyan that you always get hey you will build some product people will automatically come you don't need to spend in marketing you keep on measuring metrics and everything will grow week on week media companies say fuck this there's some value in having faith in big audacious bets in going with your intuition and then going all in on it i think that's something that i aspire to i think i've learned there so this ipl thing was uh, ipl game thing was incredibly uncomfortable for me i had not done gaming i had not done and this is at the end of the day even though i spoke with an expert a, the a theory that this tiny game will work but the faith that they showed on to me uh, lining up partners spending i mean close to 20 30 close on just marketing that just single piece and then giving me the flexibility to build a team around it and then it worked. I mean, it worked uh, to, uh, to what it needed to do. And no sort of Silicon Valley playbook will ever allow you to do this. So breaking rules and first principles for my first startup and the audacity to have big bets and follow through from Hotstar and stuff. That is super refreshing to hear, Anike. Just one follow up on that. For that, don't you think like you need to have like a super strong like you know a will or a super strong way to um, like sell it to your stakeholders right anything that you picked up from there that we think you know we could definitely apply to product even if it's not a super big bet i'm thinking this is a super like it's a critical skill right so anything yeah, that yeah. you could share right? i mean uh, storytelling or the ability to be able to get into a room and uh, turn that room and paint that story if you're able to develop that as even a second year developer or a designer or a PM, it's going to be a superpower for whatever career direction you take. How you can tactically develop it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, I, I think it will come in certain sections if we go through the Q&A, but spend time on it. Uh, so the best people that I know, Ajit Mohan, who's Facebook CEO at this point of time, Arnav, who's Lee Finance CEO at this point of time, I mean, whatever be the mood of the audience, whatever kind be the kind of the audience, being able to paint that story and be, being able to, uh, whether it, you're just an engineering manager trying to pitch why this is the right architecture. If you're a designer or if you're, let's say, a, uh, a PM trying to pitch this feature, if you're able to tell stories, if you tell stories that resonate, uh, it's, it's a wonderful skill to get. Got it. Got it. Thanks. 
Perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Ankit. And just to follow up on your deck itself, uh, before we perhaps progress to uh, other questions from the audience. So you mentioned a bunch of tools that you know uh, all of us can replace instead of building the product from scratch, for example. Also wanted to know your take on no-code apps as such. Uh, it's, it's all a big wave now, but what is your take on no-code? Do you think they're good, they're scalable? Uh, I just want to know. I mean, the movement is good. I mean, so my talk is basically effectively uh, a glorified, uh, I have deliberately not called it no code, but all everything that I've talked about are effectively some forms of no code tools. Uh, I think, I think principally this for better or for worse, I think there's going to be a set of these general purpose developers or smart people who are going to be developing products, fairly complicated flip cart level products uh, who are going to be multitasking. Uh, it might not necessarily be developers. It might not necessarily be, I mean, I'll just call them builders who will have some sense of design, who will have some sense of development. And I think this entire no code tool framework is just to sort of support this entire uh, movement. And I think that's irreversible. And my deck is basically a guide or what I think is a guide towards everybody who's, who should be moving towards that. My sort of take in sort of going as with all sort of, there is that S cycle or whatever cycle of uh, adoption of waves. At, at this point of time, no code is at, at too much of a hype, uh, I think. So you have to be sort of picky and choosy about what tools to pick. Uh, so which is why the very prescriptive kind of tools that I have mentioned are my favorite tools. So I'm not I'm not calling out Webflow. I'm calling out Tailwind UI. I'm not calling out, let's say, uh, Theme Forest. I'm calling out, again, Tailwind UI. Uh, because I think those are, Sort of low code tools and not even low code, low high quality code tools. So as long as you do low high quality, uh, low code but high quality, I think that's the best framework. Otherwise, you typically tend to run into problems. But yeah, thanks for that. Uh -huh. Yep. Akash, I think we'll jump into the audience q and I think getting a couple of upvotes and lots more questions than we expected. So um, I'll, I'll just start clubbing these questions. First set that I see is around metrics. And do you have any examples around how do you pick that one metric? I think you mentioned, right? You should drive like a single metric. So any examples on how do you go about picking? I think, I mean, this is similar. I will share the previous talk that you had around KPIs. I'll share that as well. But very quickly, if you could share some example, that would help. Yeah, I think, I think that talk goes into, goes about it. But I think, how do you, uh, so let's say, um, so this is an intuition slash experience thing. So it's a combination of everything that we talked about. Speak to your computer PM, speak with eight users, go deep. After all of that, you'll get a sense, isse mera dhanda I deliberately switch into Hindi at this point of time because I want to make sure that this isn't a formal thing. It should hit you where your heart is. It should, your your granny should be able to understand tera dhanda is se banega. Get to that point in your business. And when you ask yourself that question in Hindi or whatever your mother tongue is, you should be able to answer, oh, mera dhanda, if I get people to constantly watch, everything else sort of forgets. So in, the, in terms of when I'm actually selling cars, if I actually get just people to buy cars, that's the end metric. Everything else in the middle is just immaterial. Just buy cars, just focus the entire company on that. I think as uh, close to that as possible, that will uh, that'll be helpful. Then there is another sort of section of how you transform these metrics initially to the different stages of the company. I think that talk uh, that you talk about that deck is, I think, helpful there. Yep, yep. I'll share that with them uh, right after this. I'll I'll, I'll send a, send that deck over email. Sure. But um, Akash, do you want to take the next one? Uh, yeah. So the next question is actually from Ayush. I think the topmost uh, voted question will take in a while uh, about hiring. Uh, just wanted to understand, you know, when you actually reach out to those eight users that you mentioned, um, uh, you know, how do you actually reach out to them? Like, how do you know that these are the eight users essentially? Are they your first degree connections or yeah? So there's uh, so that eight users clouds the thing that I, I I talked about. I initially spread my net through whatever is accessible to me. So for example, in Gozumo, I spoke with people who bought and sold secondhand cars. All WhatsApp groups that I know, all Facebook pages that I know. Hey, do you know someone? Uh, your typical MBA group. Hey, I am an MBA student. I am doing this. Can you fill in this short form survey? I've done all of that. Then you get, speak with about let's say eight ten people. Then you get a sense. Okay, these kinds of people potentially have this kind of a problem. Then what you do is just figure out what is the sharpest channel to find 10 such people. So for example, in our case, it was people who are actually looking to sell cars uh, in Bangalore 
and online because we found that still Bangalore people were having sort of higher affinity to online and they had those same problems. Uh, where are they? They're on Quicker and OLX because they're, those are top platforms. Just went there and actually called up everybody. That's it. And when you call call them up and then you give them a fairly convincing fake pitch flow at that point of time or give throw the kitchen sink at them. We'll sell your car for free. We'll give you 1000 rupees because these are eight users. You can spend whatever money you can, want to. So use your DMs or LinkedIn's to get to a sort of broad sense of this is the segment that I want to target and then do scientifically. So for Photon Academy, for example, I spoke with, uh, which was a Lambda school equivalent, which is to how do you teach uh, certain, which kind of people do I teach? Do I speak people with work experience, freshers, third year people, fourth year people, three tier, three tier two. So I spoke with, and I did my usual, uh, uh, sec first degree, second degree thing. Then I figured out, okay, fourth year tier two seems to be okay. Then fourth year tier two who are in computer coding colleges seems to be even, sort of computer coding clubs seems to be even better. Where are they? They're on Code Chef, Scrape Code Chef DB. Call them. That that's all. Makes sense. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, couple of more themes that I'm seeing here is around hiring. So from both sides of the table. Uh, for senior folks here who are looking to hire their first PMs, you know, early stage, how do they go about? Is there any tips and tricks that you found to be especially useful? Maybe we could give an example, say there are two candidates similar. What is that one thing on the table that would really work for you? That would be from one side of the table. And a bunch of early folks who've joined in were asking if there's any career advice for, like, again, pres if you can be prescriptive about this, is there anything that you can help them? To really get that first job and break into PM. Uh, I think I think so. I'll take the second first. I mean, just build something and ship something. I think that's the most common answer. It's always the most common answer. Uh, do the job before you get the job. Build something. I think that's the short answer. Uh, how do you build something? Find a designer who's a friend. If you, if you don't find a designer who's a friend, then use the tools that I talked about and then just try and build something yourself. Uh, the first piece, how do you hire your first PM? Uh, I think there's a general sort of, um, there are different sort of, some different kinds of PMs, but there's sort of usually a uh, few skills that you always look for, high ownership, um, a boulder bowl, what I call is a boulder bowl. Basically you throw any walls at them and they'll just roll and break them. They don't know, they don't understand how to take no for an answer. Uh, just general structured thought and uh, the basics of leadership. Someone who's who's able to sort of hold that room, tell stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Always index for all of these things. In your first PM, index a little bit more highly on Boulder Bowls uh, because there'll be there'll just be way too many answers which are easily said no to when you are hiring in an early team. Uh, take as many Boulder Bowls as possible. So, for example, in my past, so Jani was our first Jani Pasha, who's currently the CEO of local. Uh, hyperlocal company, uh, YC funded. He was our first PM, and he had he didn't have a PM background, but he was a boulder bowl. I mean, he never took no. He would build whatever needed to be built, and he's done fantastically well. He became a fantastic PM for us. Absolutely. Is there any question while interviewing? How do you interview for that skill? Is there any like one favorite question that you have that helps you identify that? Uh, so two things. I think. Uh, uh, so the thing that you're proudest of, just try and see, uh, try and see how much, how many boulders have they actually moved in, the, in whatever they've done, the things that they're proudest of. And a uh, one shorthand question that I sometimes ask is, uh, I'm giving it away, but it's okay. Uh, how so 10x? So what business are you in, or what company is your business? Uh, uh, what business is your company in right now? If you're in Airbnb, let's say you're in the business of getting revenue from events. 10x your revenue in one and a half months. That's your target. There's a gun to your head. Do it. And then see what they do. Do they come up with, I will add this feature to a product or do they come up with, I'll go to these investors. I'll tell them I'm going to do this. Give me $10 million and then just throw the money at everybody and send discounted events. That is basically, yeah, okay, that works. That's the target. You'll be burning money, but it works, right? So the people who can think of those audacious things in, in those ridiculous targets, I think uh, they, they, they're great. Very interesting. Yeah, no, that is interesting for sure. Yeah, Ankit, just as an extension of that particular question, had you not been hiring your first PM, had it been in like a company as established as Hotstar, would you be looking for different skill sets then? Uh, so as I said, I mean, the basic skill sets still remain the same. Ownership, boulder bowl, structured thought, leadership. Uh, 
I think you would index slightly higher on uh, uh, not being a boulder bowl. Uh, I think you're okay in sort of. I'm, I'm more of a systems player. I can sort of stay around. I can execute at a high level. Uh, you would in, index slightly higher on sort of a sort of subset of leadership. A subset of leadership is also being a good follower or being able to sort of play within, play nicely with each other. So you index slightly higher sometimes on that. Uh, but honestly, I think uh, it's just sort of gradations. It, it isn't very different. Got it. We have a fun. I mean, I know we're just over time. We have a fun rapid fire for you. But before that, I'll just take one quick question. Sure. Varun asks, um, while developing hundred MS, do you have a playbook per se because you're trying to build uh, a product in the developer API space? Is there any way that you're thinking about evangelizing or you know driving adoption in this space? We have some thoughts. Uh... Uh, but this is an open question, uh, and this is also now the pitch. Anybody who wants to solve this problem, it's an incredibly inc interesting problem. So anybody who wants to solve this D uh, GTM developer evangelism uh, problem with me, so come over. Uh, it's a very, very, and it, it, it's an interesting challenge, 100MS in general, and I can speak about it for hours and hours on it, but I'll just give you a very quick sort of quick overview. I think what's fairly clear is consumer behavior has changed onto live video in a significant way where there are, such, there are certain businesses that are now going to be video dominant for a long, long time. So post-school edtech is going to be on video. There's just no question that it's not going to be more effective. And when I say edtech, this is virtual classes, gyms, whatever uh, you can talk about, personal training. Uh, a large section of events is just going to be on video. Uh, there's just no question uh, the amount of sort of reach and scale that events can reach through these online things. Anybody who's called their doctor via telehealth for a tiny problem which is never going to go to their doctor physically for, uh, you know, actually seeing I'm in a paid karawe. Which means the world's going to be much more different uh, in the next few years. And this, uh, anybody who's playing, let's say, Among Us is not going to go back to a game which doesn't have audio chat rooms uh, at any point of time. Uh, there's just going to be a plethora of companies now who are now trying to sort of reimagine their experiences on top of video and audio. Every infrastructure company that enables this at this point of time was written pre-pandemic. They were written when you'll have a team of developers who will develop this over four months and then build another state machine and then build complex codes to sort of write this out, which is why you need massive engineering teams to be able to pull something like an air meet and an academy out. This should now get down to, so 100ms should be in the list of tools that I just talked about in terms of retool, uh, Auth0 is now for login. Login used to be this complicated eight years back until sort of Auth0 sort of abstracted out a lot of this. Payment used to be this complicated until Stripe abstracted out a lot of this. So we want to design SDKs for the same, uh, this loose builder kinds of people who I have a strong vision are going to drive building in the future. Uh, very easy for them to get gold standard video quality uh and do it very very quickly and then build more complex applications on top of it so i want to be able to build um, games on top events on top breakout sessions we have sort of tons of ideas and the product sort of team behind this is fantastic uh we've done video at basically world record scales shitej who's my co-founder led facebook built facebook live built hostas global world record holding video engineering infrastructures that we can build very, very quickly. We know how to do this. I built the game, the live interactive game. I've done it at a scale that nobody else in the world has done. We know what needs to be done. We just need the people to, how to brand this, how to sort of pitch this in a world that's changing rapidly. How do you get that message across? I think is a very interesting problem. Whoever is interested, ping me, I'm hiring. Awesome. I think a lot of the 130 plus people active here might be interested. What would be the best way to reach you, Aniket? Uh, my email ID is aniket at 100ms.live. Just drop me a mail. So, Akash, if you could add that to the chat section, that would be awesome. Aniket, just before we let you go, we have a very quick rapid fire for you. And for everyone sticking around, this should be fun. Um, first up, uh, if you had to pick the three best months of your life, uh, especially with work life, what would that be? I think there were two different stretches. I, uh... If I had to pick one, I'll not cop out. I'll, I, if I had to pick out, uh, I think the three months that I was down in the trenches preparing for the first IPL at Hotstar. I think uh, everything that I relish, I was working with Shitej, who was my current co-founder. We were supposed to be hitting world record concurrencies. We are not ready for scale yet. 
we're developing this game on top which had never been done yet i didn't have a single developer designer assigned to me because everybody was focused on the core thing i had to build that team i had to basically hire people and build that bridge and then deliver deliver this exhilarating stuff managed to do that so great great times crazy if if i can ask what is your typical working hour looking like in that in that in that crazy period yeah yeah i, I mean you, i used to sleep for like 3 4 hours but it's wow. not not just me the entire team would sleep for 4 hours and it's not always but i mean, yeah it's a yeah. fairly uh, yeah got it got it Awesome. Moving on to the second one, uh, three early stage startups that you're excited about, preferably early stage that many people others might not have access to, other than yours, of course, <laughs> and Arnav's. <laughs> so Arnav's company, Leap Finance, Leap's got a fantastic problem. Uh, very simple, uh, tough to find that team. Um, be honest, I've honestly not thought about this uh, very well. But can I have sort of global answers or local answers, Indian answers? Sure, sure, no problem. Yeah. And- I think Stripe is just always wonderful. Shopify is always wonderful. Uh, I think they have always come up in all these global Twitter threads, but they've sort of been my dream go-to companies for a long time. I just admire those companies. I love Retool. Uh, I think that company has potential to improve significantly from where they are, uh, but uh, I, I I can't imagine how how they are very bad at certain things, but very good at certain things. So I love that about them. Um, in India. Hasura, oh, I, I'm in love with Hasura. I love them. Um, yeah, I think I think these companies. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, last up, we have one question. Uh, this we generally ask for people who are active on Twitter, not exactly. So we ask them around, what is that one draft in your Twitter DM that you haven't posted because it was too controversial? But I know you're not too active on Twitter. But is there anything that is on your DMs? <laughs> yeah something to do with uh, developers get off your high horses or something of that sort <laughs> okay okay it's been a hard time hard time hiring right now yeah so, I'm, i'm not going to sort of make that no, no, sure, sure. absolute okay we have an alternate question for you and this i think might be easy for you is uh, three folks who've really inspired you or you know that you'd like to just give a shout out to that you think the rest of us should definitely connect with uh arnav uh my first co-founder currently ceo with leap finance fantastic leader uh the ability to sort of sway rooms move uh, uh people i think is amazing uh shitej who's my current co-founder if you want the definition of a boulder ball who doesn't take no for answer just meet him fantastic okay. person so when he launched facebook like everybody told this can't be launched at the, in at that point of time in the latency and the scale that he, he just did it facebook everybody told us you don't At sorry, hot star. Everybody told us, "Hey, YouTube crashes at two million. What are you going to do? How are you going to build this?" We built it till now. We hot star handles like twenty five million concurrency, and uh, YouTube crashed at two two million at FIFA World Cup. He just doesn't know how to take an answer, and he he constantly keep on building. He's just amazing, amazing person. Very sharp. Um, uh, Shitej, who's my current co-founder, Arnav, Arnav uh, Ajit Mohan, uh, fantastic, fantastic leader, structure. clarity of thought uh, who's facebook ceo right now awesome awesome i think with that i think lots and lots for us to take away thank you so much for your time aniket and always i think i i have said this multiple times on you know the whatsapp groups and definitely encourage people to just attend this session even the previous one this one was great i think just love the fact that you you know come up with tactical thing that people can apply and yo yep, thank you so much for your time akash anything that you would like to add or aniket anything you would like to leave us with any closing comment floor is yours oh, always happy to chat i mean you guys are doing a wonderful job uh, the amount of the kind of speakers that you brought in the high quality of uh, i have seen you guys grow i think i think i probably did one of the, probably the, the f- first, more first yeah. one or one of the first ones when yeah. you guys were sort of fairly early and to see how far you've come uh, you uh, like you got the superhuman guy you got shares you got Just I mean every single father brought management into this community. It's it's a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. So always happy to be a part, um, and uh, you know glad to be here. Share whatever I've, I I can. Thank you, thank you so much, Aniket, for all the support. And guys, everyone who st- like stuck around, do definitely reach out to Aniket. You could add him on you know social media. Do de- we we've, we've shared his uh, uh, email ID here. So if you'd like to chat about what he's building, definitely do drop him. And if you like the session, do give him a shout out on Twitter. Encourage him to be more active. I'm sure all of us have so much to learn. 
and yes with that i think since that you, you guys have stuck around we'll be sharing another link to a discounted coupon to the summit so if you guys are around if you're interested in that space we've sold out the passes but this is going to be valid for you know the 12 hours i think adi shared it here so do check it out and hope to see you guys there thanks everyone once again and we'd love to hear any feedback twitter dms open see you again next weekend all right thanks guys uh, actually just a final closing pitch i'm hiring 400 ms so if you're developers pms any good folks it's a incredibly tough problem we are going up against zoom microsoft in saying that our technology is going to be better than this so we have a small global team who are all sort of experts at what they are and now we need to find more developers to sort of add to the team a uh, very challenging problem find sort of great business folks gtm folks customer success folks anybody who's interested do dm me um also if you have just outside of this any feedback on the talk feel free to reach out to me directly on a- any social media on email uh, happy to always improve awesome thanks so much and again all right we'll see you bye cheers bye bye see you guys thanks so bye. much for joining in thanks akash thanks so much thanks and bye guys if you guys are around for some more time we'll be hanging around in the lounge section i think there are still about 85 people so yep if you are around to chat anything product anything about community that we are building or anything that we could help with uh, we'll see you in the lounge section see you